Join us, cherished listener, in the unfolding of the fog of ancient plagues, a story that dances to the rhythm of imagination crafted by StoryWave AI. Become part of our storytelling family by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Chapter 1. Dead Rise in the West The sun hadn't yet clawed its way above the horizon when I first heard the commotion, a clamor of shouts and gunshots that shattered the pre-dawn stillness of our little town. I sat up, the blanket falling away, and my hand instinctively reached for the revolver under my pillow. The air in my room hung heavy with a sense of foreboding, as if the world itself was holding its breath. My heart raced, a wild Mustang thundering against the confines of my ribcage. I crept to the window, peering out with caution. The streets below were a canvas of chaos, painted with the frantic strokes of townsfolk running, pleading, and falling. And among them I glimpsed the impossible, figures lurching with an unhallowed gait, their groans a grotesque symphony accompanying the violence of their feasting. Laura, Laura Tolber, the urgent bellow of my name pulled me from the window. Sheriff Hawkins stood below, his face grim as he beckoned me forth. Sheriff, what in God's creation is going on? My voice was steady, though each word felt like it was being dragged from a well of dread. It's the McCoy family, Laura. They've turned different. Like they'd been bit by the very devil himself, he said, his eyes a mirror to the pandemonium that unfurled around us. I knew of the McCoys, good folks who had never caused a stir, now the epicenter of an unholy outbreak. I shuddered, not from the chill of the morning, but from the chilling reality clawing into our world. There ain't time for gawking, I muttered to myself, turning from the window. I dressed in haste, donning my sturdy denims and boots, my movements mechanical, a puppet pulled by the strings of survival. My trusty hat, adorned with eagle feathers, rested on the dresser, and I snatched it up, setting it firmly atop my head. It was a small comfort, a familiar weight against the growing weight of fear. Zoe, my loyal chestnut mare, nickered softly as I approached the stable her brown eyes wide and reflecting the unease that had settled over us. I stroked her broad forehead, the white blaze, a clear-cut difference against the deepening gloom. We're riding out, Zoe. Can't stay put with hell breaking loose, I whispered, my voice a strange calm in the storm. I saddled her up with practiced ease, every strap and buckle a silent promise to keep us both safe from the nightmare that had befallen us. As we made our way to the edge of town, a figure stumbled into our path a man, or at least the shell of one. His flesh was ashen, eyes clouded like the sky before a tempest, and he reached for me with hands that were no longer human. I reined Zoe in sharply, my breath catching. I'd never taken a life, but the thing before me bore no spark of life to take. It was an abomination, a manifestation of death itself. My revolver was in my hand before I knew it, the barrel steady despite the quake in my soul. I'm sorry, I murmured though the words were meant for me rather than the creature. The shot echoed, a grim punctuation to the sentence that our world had become. Time had run out, the cries behind us grew closer, the dead marching with relentless hunger. I spurred Zoe forward, each hoofbeat a drumbeat signaling our escape. We galloped through fields that once brimmed with life, now fallow witnesses to the rise of the dead in the West. As the town faded behind us, a vast and uncharted wilderness lay ahead. The fog of ancient plagues had descended upon us, and it was within its suffocating embrace that I would find the measure of my own spirit. Fear had to be corralled, disbelief tethered, for the odyssey of survival had only just begun, and I, Laura Tolber, would not yield to the darkness. Chapter 2. The Long Goodbye The door creaked a lament as I pushed it open, the sound cutting through the silence like a verdict. Inside, shadows clung to the corners, as if afraid of what the light might reveal. My boots thudded against the wooden floor, each step a heavy heartbeat in the quiet. Mama, Pa, my voice, a whisper, hoping against hope that they had been spared the horror that had befallen the town. The silence that greeted me was an unwelcome answer. The stench hit me first, a sickly sweet decay. It was the smell of rot, of death, and it filled the house like an unbidden guest. I ventured further into the parlor, where the first light of day was brave and enter through the delicate curtains. There they were, my kin, huddled together as if in prayer, Ma and little Eli, their bodies still and cold. But their stillness was a deceit, for as the light crept closer, a macabre truth revealed itself. 
Their eyes, once full of warmth, were now clouded orbs, and their skin bore the pallor of the grave. Ely, my voice broke the silence, a fracture line running through my resolve. He turned, a grotesque mimicry of the lively boy he once was. His eyes met mine, and in them I saw the abyss staring back. A wound on his arm, dark and oozing, was the cruel signature of his fate. Laura, is that you? It was Ma's voice, but strained, as though it clawed its way up from the depths. Ma, I. Words failed me, lodged in my throat like thorns. We tried to fight it, she murmured, her voice a ghost of itself. But Eli, he was just too curious about the commotion outside. He got too close to one of them, McCoy's. My world already shattered, fragmented further. I knew the choice before me, as stark and merciless as the dawn. To stay was to share their fate. To leave was to abandon the very blood of my being. Y'all need to get away from here, Pa said, his voice a rasp. Don't let this plague take you too. Tears stung my eyes, but I blinked them back. There was no room for weeping, not when survival beckoned with a stern finger. I approached Eli, my little brother, the boy who'd followed me like a shadow on sunlit days. Remember when we used to race across the fields, Eli? You always had the wind at your heels, I said, my voice steady, though it felt like I was speaking from a great distance. He nodded, a jerky, unnatural movement. I always wanted to be fast like you, Laura. My hand trembled as I placed it upon his head, a final benediction. You were always faster than you knew, Eli, I whispered, choking back the sorrow that threatened to overwhelm me. The sun crested the horizon, spilling light like a benediction over the land. With a heavy heart, I turned from my family from Eli and stepped back into the brightness of the new day. There was no room for a lingering goodbye, for the plague that had visited us was impatient and insatiable. I mounted Zoe once more, my gaze fixed on the horizon. The homestead receded behind me, a fading memory as I rode toward an uncertain future. The agony of departure was a raw wound, but it was the price of hope, the cost of seeking safety in a world gone mad. The fog of ancient plagues had claimed my home, my family, but it would not claim my spirit. Ahead lay the Odyssey, an uncharted path fraught with perils and heartache. Yet within me burned a flame, a conviction to endure, to survive, and to bear witness to the long goodbye. Chapter 3, Ghost Towns and Graveyards I urged Zoe forward, my own breath, the only sign of life as we navigated the avenues of abandonment. Dust devils danced around us, the only things left with any semblance of vigor in this place. It was a town gutted of its soul, and each empty homestead I passed was a stark reminder of what was lost. The echo of my journey seemed to rouse the slumbering dead, for a low, guttural murmur began to fill the air. I pulled Zoe to a stop, straining my ears. The sound grew in volume, a discordant chorus of the damned that sent a shiver down my spine. Easy, girl, I whispered patting Zoe's neck as she shifted nervously beneath me. I slipped from the saddle, my boots scuffing the ground and peered around the corner of a dilapidated general store. There they were, a horde of the undead, meandering aimlessly with a hunger that was insatiable. My heart pounded against my chest, a feral drum calling to the primal part of my soul that screamed to flee. But panic was a luxury I couldn't afford. I surveyed my surroundings, the gears in my mind turning as I weighed my options. The store to my left, its windows boarded and door ajar, offered a temporary hideaway. To my right, a rickety old cart lay overturned, spilling its long-rotted wares onto the street. Making a snap decision, I grabbed a fistful of debris from the cart and hurled it with all my might into the alley across the way. The clatter it made was a siren call to the undead, drawing them away from my position. Like the grim tide, they turned and shuffled toward the noise, affording me a narrow path of escape. I led Zoe by her reins, keeping us both low and out of sight as we slipped into the shadows of the alley. The stench of decay was thick in the air, a tangible reminder of the ever-present death that clung to this world like a shroud. We emerged on the other side of the town, the sun dipping low in the sky, painting the desolation in hues of fire and blood. Behind us, the horde's groans faded into the distance, but the sound lingered in my ears, a haunting melody I knew I'd never forget. I hoisted myself back onto Zoe, my gaze lingering on the horizon. Each abandoned town I passed was another chapter in this tale of ruin, another grave in this vast graveyard that stretched as far as the eye could see.
but I couldn't let the specter of despair drag me down. I had to keep moving, to survive, to bear witness to the devastation that this plague had wrought upon the land. As night fell, I made camp in the shadow of an old church, its steeple pointing accusingly at the heavens. There, under the watchful eye of the forsaken sanctuary, I found a moment's peace in the stillness. But even as I rested, I knew that with the dawn, I would face the world anew, a world of ghost towns and graveyards, where I would continue to navigate the maze of desolation and danger that lay before me. Chapter 4. Desert Dangers The sun, a merciless overseer, beat down upon us, and the heat was a tangible force, a wall that seemed to push back with every step we took. It was in this barren expanse that the dead seemed to hold less dominion. But nature itself had turned adversary. Keep steady, Zoe, I told her as we navigated a particularly treacherous slope, the sand shifting beneath us like the loyalties of the world I'd known. As if in response to my words, a chilling howl cut through the stillness, a herald of new perils. Zoe's muscles tensed beneath me, her instincts as a prey animal flaring to life. It wasn't long before we saw them, coyotes, but not as they once were. Their eyes held the same clouded hunger as the humans turned fiend, and their movements were erratic, unpredictable. I pulled Zoe to a stop, scanning the surroundings. The coyotes were closing in, their forms ghostly phantoms in the heat haze. I couldn't outrun them, not here, not in their domain, but perhaps I didn't have to. Zoe, you remember that trick I taught you? The one we played on Hawkins' boy when he thought he could outride us? I spoke calmly, keeping my voice low. Zoe flicked an ear back, listening, trusting. I dismounted, my boots sinking slightly into the warm sand, and retrieved a length of rope from my saddlebag. With swift movements, I fashioned a lasso, a skill passed down from my paw that had been meant for cattle, not the undead. All right, girl, it's just like we practiced. On my mark, I said, positioning myself between Zoe and the oncoming pack. The coyotes drew nearer, and I could see the grotesque details, the matted fur, the foam at their jaws, the way their paws seemed to barely touch the ground. I swung the lasso, letting it gain momentum, and then I let it fly. The rope sailed through the air, landing true around the neck of the lead coyote. With a sharp tug, I brought it down, the others momentarily startled by the fall of their alpha. It was the distraction we needed. I leapt back onto Zoe's saddle, and we bolted the rest of the pack giving chase but falling behind as Zoe's powerful legs carried us towards safety. As we put distance between us and the unnatural predators, the desert's vastness enveloped us once more. There was a beauty here, stark and unforgiving, that transcended the horror that had gripped the world. The cacti stood like sentinels, the mesas watched over us like ancient guardians, and the sky painted pictures of freedom and eternity. That night, as we camped in the shadow of a towering rock formation, I pondered the dual nature of this new world. There was death, yes, death in forms both familiar and grotesque, but there was also life, enduring, adapting, and in its own harsh way, thriving. Zoe nuzzled my hand as I sat, the stars are only light. You did good today, girl. Better than good, I murmured, my voice blending with the whispers of the night. We were alone, Zoe and I, but as I looked up at the heavens, I felt a connection to something greater, a cycle of existence that no plague could fully extinguish. Tomorrow would bring more challenges, more dangers. But tonight, in the desert's embrace, I found a moment's peace amidst the desolation. Chapter 5, Prairie of the Perished I kept my gaze fixed on the horizon, searching for any sign of movement, any hint of the deathly hordes that now roamed these lands. The prairie was a vast, open tomb, and we were the living trespassing upon its quiet. Suddenly, the ground shook with a distant thunder, a vibration that grew in intensity until it was undeniable. Zoe's ears flicked, her body tensed, and my hand instinctively went to the rifle slung across my back. Easy, girl, I murmured, though my own nerves were alight with alarm. The thunder resolved into a low rumble, and then I saw them, a swarm of the undead a surging mass of decay that rolled across the prairie like a wave of locusts. There were hundreds, maybe thousands, and in their midst, a figure stood out, a woman in a torn wedding dress, her face as pale as the gown she wore, her eyes empty of all but hunger. I kicked Zoe into a gallop, the swarm too vast to consider fighting. We were running, the prairie that had seemed so tranquil now a trap that threatened to ensnare us in its deadly embrace. 
as we fled, a voice cut through the chaos, rough and ragged as the landscape itself. Head for the river, it'll slow him down. I turned toward the voice and saw him, a figure atop a rise, rifle in hand, his silhouette stark against the sky. Without thought, I steered Zoe in his direction, trusting the stranger more than the encroaching death at our heels. We reached the river, its waters a churning barrier between life and undeath. Zoe plunged in without hesitation, the current fighting against us, but her strength was unyielding. I looked back to see the horde descending into the water, their movements hampered by the pull of the river, the woman in white now just another lost soul dragged down by the relentless flow. Come on, you can make it, the stranger shouted, extending a hand to help pull us up the opposite bank. With a final push, Zoe crested the bank, and we collapsed on the other side, gasping for breath soaked but alive. The stranger looked down at us, his face lined with the tales of a hundred battles against the scourge that now defined our existence. Name's Clayton, he said, his voice a gravely sound that seemed to resonate with the very earth we lay upon. Laura, I replied, my chest heaving as I struggled to regain my composure. And this is Zoe. He nodded, his gaze returning to the river where the undead struggled futilely against the current. You've got a strong horse there, Laura, and good instincts, heading for the water. I sat up, watching the swarm diminish as the river claimed them, a grim reminder of the life-or-death decisions that now punctuated our days. Seems like you've got a few survival tricks yourself, I said, an acknowledgement of the bond that was formed between survivors in these end times. Clayton shrugged, a ghost of a smile touching his lips. We all pick up a thing or two when the world's trying to kill us. I looked at the prairie beyond, its beauty marred by the grotesque parade we had just escaped. Among the undead, I had seen glimpses of the people they once were, lives and loves torn asunder. It was a sobering thought, one that I pushed aside as I rose to my feet, determined to face whatever came next. Together, Zoe, Clayton, and I watched the sun dip below the horizon, the prairie of the perished claiming another day. In this new world, each sunrise was uncertain, each step uncharted, but as long as we drew breath, we would continue to traverse the odyssey laid out before us, wherever it might lead. Chapter 6. A Night at Fort Griffin We were greeted at the gates by a sentry whose eyes bore the weight of too many sunsets. State your business, he called down from his post, rifle poised. Seeking shelter for the night, I replied, my voice carrying the wariness of the dusty trails we traversed. He nodded, and with a groan of weathered wood and iron, the gates creaked open. Inside, a motley assembly of survivors had made their home amidst the fort's protective embrace. Jeremiah, a sharpshooter whose rifle was as much a part of him as his shadow, tipped his hat as I dismounted. Welcome to what's left of civilization, he said, a wry smile touching his lips. Thanks, I said, casting a glance around the courtyard, where the remnants of humanity clung like stubborn weeds in a wasteland. We won't be any trouble. Trouble's the one thing we've got in abundance, ma'am, Jeremiah replied, leading us to where Zoe could be stabled and watered. But for tonight, you can hang your hat and rest easy. The evening passed with a semblance of normalcy, the survivors sharing stories around a flickering campfire. Laughter, a rare sound, punctuated the night, weaving a fragile thread of hope through the heart of Fort Griffin. You know, Jeremiah began, his voice low as the flames cast dancing shadows upon his face. It's moments like these that remind me of what we're fighting for, not just for survival, but for these slivers of life. I nodded, the words resonating deep within. It's easy to forget there was a world before all this, where a night like this was just another evening. True enough, he agreed, but it's the remembering that keeps us human in the face of all that would strip it away. The calm was shattered by a commotion at the wall, a sentinel's cry slicing through the night. Breach! We have a breach! Chaos erupted as the survivors grabbed their weapons, the idyllic respite morphing into a nightmarish fray. The undead, those relentless harbingers of doom, had found a weakness in the fort's defenses and were pouring in like floodwaters through a broken dam. Jeremiah and I found ourselves back to back, his rifle crackling with precise fury, my own pistols barking in response to the encroaching horde. The fort's courtyard became a maelstrom of violence, each shot, each desperate cry, an attestation to the unyielding will to live. 
We need to seal the breach. Jeremiah shouted over the din, reloading with swift, practiced motions. I nodded, my mind racing. Cover me. I dashed toward the breach, the figures of my former kin reaching out with gnarled hands and gaping maws. I fired, reloaded, fired again, each undead that fell a step closer to salvation or damnation. With a final effort, I heaved against the barricade, a slab of wood and iron that groaned in protest before sliding into place, cutting off the flow of death. My breath came in ragged gasps as I slumped against the barrier, the sounds of battle still raging behind me. We held him, Jeremiah said, appearing beside me, his face streaked with soot and sweat. Thanks to you, I shook my head, pushing back to my feet. No, thanks to all of us. As dawn broke over Fort Griffin, the fort stood, a battered testament to the recoverability of those within. The night's horrors were etched upon each survivor's face, but we had weathered the storm together. Jeremiah and I exchanged a look, a silent acknowledgement of the bond formed in the crucible of conflict. Fort Griffin had offered a night of respite, but it was the tragedy that had truly united us, a group of strangers now forged into comrades by the fires of adversity. The day greeted us with the promise of continued struggle, but also with the certainty that we were not alone in this fight. The fog of ancient plagues might have blanketed the land, but within the walls of Fort Griffin, the embers of humanity still burned bright. Chapter 7, Ruins of Refuge. I led our small band through the arched gateway, the ironwork twisted and rusted, a declaration to the relentless march of decay. Inside, the mission's once hallowed halls echoed with the silence of desolation. Jeremiah, Clayton, and I exchanged wary glances before venturing further into the sanctuary's depths. Our footsteps disturbed the dust of ages, a fine powder that seemed to carry the whispers of those who had once sought solace within these walls. The main chamber opened up before us, a vast space with a ceiling that soared to shadowy heights. Pews lay in disarray, their wood split and splintered, as if in the throes of some great struggle. It was then that we heard it, the cough of a child, frail and forlorn, shattering the stillness. We rounded a corner and found them, a group huddled around a small fire, their faces etched with weariness and suspicion. Who goes there? The challenge came from a man with a beard like a briar patch, his eyes sharp and calculating beneath a furrowed brow. Laura, I answered, my hand resting on the butt of my pistol. We're just looking for shelter for the night. The group's circle opened slightly, revealing a child wrapped in blankets, her face pale and her breath shallow. The sight tugged at something within me, a string of humanity that the horrors of this new world had yet to sever. We don't want any trouble, I continued, my eyes meeting each of theirs in turn. We can keep to ourselves, share some food, maybe even trade stories. The man with the beard, who seemed to be their leader, spat into the fire. Stories don't mean nothing now, ain't nothing left but surviving. A woman beside him, her hair a tangled nest of worry, laid a hand on his arm. Tom, the child's sick. Maybe they got medicine. Tom's gaze flicked to the woman and then back to me, a silent battle raging behind his eyes. You got any doctoring skills? Clayton stepped forward, his voice steady. I've patched up a few injuries in my time. Let me take a look at the girl. There was a collective breath held, a moment suspended between trust and trepidation before Tom nodded curtly. All right, but the rest of you stay where you are. Clayton knelt beside the child, his large, calloused hands surprisingly gentle as he assessed her condition. Jeremiah and I watched, our presence a silent vow of protection. She's got the fever, Clayton announced, after a time. Not the plague, mind you, but she needs medicine. Quinine would do best. We ain't got none of that, Tom grumbled, his gaze shifting to the long shadows cast by the dying fire. Ain't got much of anything. I stepped closer, my voice soft but resolute. We have some supplies. We can help her. The offer hung in the air, a fragile olive branch extended in a world where trust was as scarce as mercy. Tom eyed me, weighing my words against the harsh ledger of survival. Why would you help us? The suspicion in his voice was a knife edge, ready to cut the tentative ties we were forming. Because she's a child, I said simply. And if we start turning our backs on children, then we're no better than the dead outside these walls. The night grew colder. The fire's glow dimming, as if in sympathy with the dwindling hope of our two groups. But as the first light of dawn began to seep through the cracks of the mission's facade, 
a decision was made. We'll take your help, Tom conceded, his voice grudging but not unkind. But after that, you go your way, we'll go ours. I nodded, understanding the terms. The standoff had ended, not with a blaze of gunfire, but with the quiet realization that even in the ruins of refuge, we could still offer each other a semblance of warmth, a glimmer of compassion. As Jeremiah and I prepared to leave the mission behind, the sight of the recovering child, her cheeks flushed with newfound life, served as a stark reminder of the fragility and strength that coexisted within us all. In a world where every sunrise was uncertain, we had chosen to be a light in the darkness, however brief. And with that choice, we carried on, our path forward etched with the trials of survival and the echoes of our shared humanity. Chapter 8, The Alamo Undead. Clayton, his eyes scanning the perimeter, broke the silence that had fallen over our band of weary souls. They'll be upon us come nightfall. This fort's seen its share of sieges, but none like this. Jeremiah, rifle in hand, nodded. The Alamo held once, but that was against flesh and blood, not this, this walking damnation. An old man among us, grizzled and bent with age, stirred from where he sat against a cannon long cold. I fought here many moons ago. We held him off for thirteen days. His voice trailed off, his gaze lost in memories of a distant past. I knelt beside him, my hand on his shoulder. We've got less than thirteen hours, Samuel. Any wisdom from those days that could help us now? Samuel lifted his head, his eyes gleaming with the embers of long-spent youth. We used what we had, he began, his voice gaining strength. Cannons, rifles, walls, every inch of this place became a weapon. I looked to the others, determination setting my jaw. We'll do the same. Use what we have. The plan was hatched in haste, our resources limited, but our single-mindedness unbreakable. We barricaded the entrances, fortified the walls, and prepared our meager armaments. The undead horde, a sea of corruption, advanced with the setting sun, their silhouettes a grotesque parody of the army that once laid siege to this very fort. They're coming, shouted one of our number, a young woman named Grace, as she peered through the cracks in our defenses. The old man Samuel took up a position beside me, a rusted but functional rifle in his hands. Let's give him a taste of Alamo lead, he said, the ghost of a grin on his weathered face. The undead crashed against our bulwark like waves upon the shore. Gunshots rang out, a staccato rhythm punctuating the night, as we fought with the ferocity of those who have everything to lose. Samuel's shots were precise, each one finding its mark with the expertise of a veteran soldier. We can't hold him forever, Laura. Jeremiah's voice cut through the din, urgent and strained. I knew he was right. We needed an escape, a way out that didn't lead us straight into the jaws of death. My eyes caught sight of an old chapel door, its wood splintered but holding. There, we break through the chapel. It'll lead us to the back courtyard. The fight raged on, a symphony of chaos, as we made our way to the chapel. The door gave way under the force of our combined strength, and we spilled into the darkness beyond, the undead mere steps behind us. The back courtyard was a maze of shadows and ruins, but it offered a sliver of hope, a gap in the fort's defenses, long forgotten by time. Now, I cried, and we surged forward, Samuel's steps faltering as a ghoul in tattered rags gripped him with hands that knew only hunger. No, the anguish in my voice was a raw wound as I turned back, firing at the creature that held Samuel, but it was too late. His sacrifice gave us the moments we needed, the distraction that tore at my heart even as it saved our lives. We ran, the Alamo receding into the night, its walls stained with a new chapter of blood and bravery. The loss of Samuel, the old soldier who had once fought for Texas liberty, weighed heavy on our spirits. His final stand, a demonstration to the indomitable human will, would be etched in my memory as we pushed beyond the limits of our endurance. The Alamo, a fortress of the undead, lay behind us now, but the battle had brought us closer, forged us into more than survivors, into defenders, guardians of the remnants of a world that refused to be consumed by the fog of ancient plagues. Chapter 9, Barricades and Bullets. All right, folks, I began, my voice cutting through the morning chill. We've got one shot at this. Let's make sure it counts. Before us lay a scattering of materials that we had salvaged, scraps of wood, coils of wire, and the last of our ammunition. Our survival hinged on the cunning of our traps and the steadiness of our hands. 
Jeremiah, his eyes scanning the horizon, nodded solemnly. We can't hold out forever with bullets alone. This trap of yours, Laura, it's gotta work. It'll work, I assured him, not entirely convinced myself, but knowing that belief was half the battle won. We set to work, our movements deliberate. The trap was simple but clever, a network of tripwires connected to a makeshift alarm, an early warning system against the approaching undead. Clayton frowned, his fingers working a stubborn knot in the wire. This is all well and good, Laura, but if they come at us hard, we're going to be sitting ducks without enough lead to throw back at them. I surveyed the perimeter, my mind racing through every possible scenario. We'll have to rely on more than just firepower today. Ingenuity is our greatest weapon. As the sun rose higher, casting its searing gaze upon the world, we finished our preparations. The trap was set, a silent guardian waiting for the inevitable onslaught. The attack came with the subtlety of a thunderclap. A groan rose from the east, an indicator of the horde that swarmed toward us, their bodies a grotesque conglomerate of decay. The tripwire snapped, the alarm a clarion call to arms. Jeremiah took his position, the rifle feeling like an extension of his own being. Here they come, he muttered, the first shot ringing out, a lone herald of the maelstrom to follow. We fought with a ferocity born of necessity, each bullet finding its mark. But as the gunpowder burned and the casings fell, the stark reality set in. We were running out of ammunition. Clayton, his face a mask of concentration, took careful aim with his last round. Make every shot count, he said, the phrase a mantra for our dwindling hope. The undead pressed on, undeterred by their fallen kin, a relentless tide of hunger and ruin. It was then, in our darkest moment, that the trap proved its worth. A cascade of debris, cleverly rigged above, tumbled down upon the unsuspecting horde, crushing and scattering them with the indiscriminate wrath of gravity. The dust settled, and silence reigned once more. We stood among the remains of our last stand, victorious but hollow. The trap had saved us, but at what cost? Our ammunition was spent, our resources exhausted. Jeremiah broke the stillness, his voice weary but edged with relief. We lived through the day, Laura. That's more than many can say. I nodded, the weight of leadership heavy upon my shoulders. We did, but tomorrow's another fight, and we'll face it with empty chambers. The group gathered, their faces etched with the scars of survival, and I saw in their eyes the reflection of my own resolve. We had overcome the impossible, not with brute force, but with the cunning and spirit that defined us. As the day waned and the sun dipped below the horizon, we took stock of our situation. The barricades and bullets had held, but tomorrow was a vast, unknown landscape. We would move forward, compelled by the indomitable human will to endure, to fight, to live. Each step was a witness to our adaptability, each breath a defiance of the fog of ancient plagues that sought to claim us. Chapter 10, Beyond the Horizon. Laura, you sure about this? That these mountains are hiding some promised land? I adjusted the weight of my pack, feeling the press of its contents against my back. It's the closest thing to certain we've had since this nightmare began. The scouts in the last town swore there's a sanctuary beyond these peaks. We have to try. Grace, the young woman whose survivability had become a cornerstone of our survival, chimed in, her voice tinged with fatigue. We've seen what staying put brings us. Maybe it's time to chase a horizon for a change. The ascent was arduous, a steep and unforgiving climb that demanded every ounce of strength we could muster. Each handhold, each precarious foothold, was a victory against the mountain that stood between us and the chance at safety. As the day wore on and the altitude clawed at our lungs, the thinner air became a cruel adversary. Jeremiah, normally unflappable, coughed violently, his breaths coming in sharp gasps. Keep going, he rasped, waving us on as he leaned against a boulder, his rifle slipping from his grasp. Don't mind me. I knelt beside him, placing a firm hand on his shoulder. We don't leave anyone behind. That's not how we've made it this far. He looked up, his eyes reflecting the struggle within. Laura, if I slow you down, the dead catch up. You can't afford that, not with so many counting on you. I locked eyes with him, the unspoken bond between us as palpable as the chill mountain air. We're stronger together than we are apart. You taught me that. Clayton and Grace joined us, forming a tight circle of solidarity. We'll take turns helping Jeremiah, Grace said, her determination belying her slender frame. 
If the dead come, we'll be ready. The mountain relented as the day bled into twilight, the sanctuary rumored to be nestled in the valley below. But as we crested the final ridge, the silence that greeted us was more foreboding than any groan of the undead. There, in the basin, lay ruins, charred timbers and smoldering embers, where hope had been. The sanctuary was no more. Its promise of safety had been raised by the relentless scourge we fled. Despair loomed like a specter over us, and I felt the weight of leadership bearing down with a crushing force. It was in this moment of abject sorrow that Jeremiah found his feet, standing tall despite his ailment. We make our own sanctuary, he declared, his voice a clarion call in the gathering dusk. We've come this far. We face what's ahead together like we always have. The group rallied around his words, the embers of determination rekindled in their eyes. We descended into the valley, our hearts heavy, but our spirits unbroken. The night that followed was one of hard choices and sacrifices. We fortified what remained, set watches, and tended to the wounded. Through it all, the stark realization that the horizon would always harbor both peril and promise became our truth. We would carve out our safety in this new world, not because it was given, but because we had the will to create it. The mountains had taken much from us, but they had also shown us the metal of our resolve. As the first light of a new day broke, it painted the valley with hues of gold and amber, a solemn reminder that for every night that closed in around us, a dawn awaited, full of fear, full of hope, full of life. And we, the weary travelers on this odyssey of the damned, would face it head on. Chapter 11, The Last Stand. Clayton was the first to break the silence that had settled upon us, his voice a gravelly echo that seemed to come from a place of deep resolve. We're close now, just over this ridge. But that horde, they're the largest we've seen yet. I followed his gaze to the valley below, where the undead thronged in numbers that defied count, a writhing mass of decay moving as one insatiable entity. We knew it wouldn't be easy, I replied, my voice steady, despite the tremor of fatigue that threatened to betray me. Grace, her face smudged with the soot of too many fires and her eyes bright with the sheen of unshed tears, clutched her rifle close. If we don't make it through the night, she began, her voice barely a whisper. I just want you both to know. Stop that talk. I cut in, sharper than I intended. We didn't come this far to give up at the sight of victory. Jeremiah, who had been silent, a sentinel watching the horizon, finally spoke. Laura's right. We've got one last fight in us. If this is where we make our stand, then let's make it one they'll remember. The hours passed, each minute a lifetime, as we fortified our position, laying traps and planning our assault. The night was upon us when they came, the undead, like a tide drawn forth by the pull of the moon. The battle was a din of gunfire, screams, and the relentless, guttural moans of the horde. We fought back to back, our bullets a fleeting reprieve against the onslaught. But as my magazine clicked empty and the wave of death pressed closer, I felt the icy grip of despair. It was then that the world shifted, the ground beneath our feet trembling with the force of an untamed fury. A rumble grew to a roar as the ridge we stood upon gave way, the earth itself rebelling against the defilement of the undead. Clayton grabbed my arm, pulling me back as the land opened, swallowing the horde into its newly formed chasm. Nature's on our side tonight, he shouted over the tumult, his words filled with a wild hope. As the dust settled and the echoes of the earth's upheaval faded, we were left standing, panting, and more alive than ever before. The undead were gone, entombed in the belly of the land they had sought to consume. In the silence that followed, I felt the weight of my mortality like never before. Each breath was a gift, each heartbeat a drum of survival that beat a rhythm of defiance against the odds. We made it, Grace said, her voice a hushed reverence to the moment. We're still here. Jeremiah, ever the stoic, finally allowed a smile to grace his lips. We are, he confirmed. And as long as we stand together, there's nothing we can't face. As we looked out toward the sanctuary, now so close I could almost hear the whispered prayers of those within, I knew that our fight was not yet over. But this victory, this moment, was a testament to our perseverance, to our refusal to be snuffed out by the creeping fog of ancient plagues. We would make it to the sanctuary, a bittersweet triumph marked by the losses we had endured and the sacrifices we had made. 
but we would enter not just as survivors, but as warriors of the human spirit, unbowed and unbroken. Chapter 12, Dawn of the Desert Rose. Would you look at that? Grace's voice was a whisper, as if too loud a word might shatter the scene before us. Clayton let out a low whistle, his demeanor uncharacteristically subdued. This is what we've been hoping for, isn't it? Civilization, still standing. The gates of the community opened as we approached, and a group of folks came out to greet us. Their leader, a woman with hair the color of the wheat fields that surrounded the town, stepped forward with an outstretched hand. Welcome, she said, her grip firm and sure. I'm Marianne, head of the council. You've had quite the journey to get here. We exchanged introductions, our voices mingling with the sound of the awakening town. The community was a hodgepodge of survivors, each with a story etched into the lines of their faces. Seems you've got a thriving place here, I remarked, taking in the buzz of activity as people went about their morning routines. Marianne nodded. We've been lucky, but it's more than luck. It's hard work and strict rules. Keeps us safe, keeps us alive. Integrating into this new society was like stepping into a dance whose steps we had yet to learn. The community was welcoming but wary. Their trust had to be earned. We were assigned quarters, a small house on the edge of the community that would become our sanctuary within the sanctuary. The following days were a whirlwind of activity. We contributed where we could, aiding in the fields, reinforcing the walls, sharing the knowledge we'd gathered in our travels. But with each task, each interaction, the delicate balance of this new life became more apparent. One evening, as the sun dipped below the mountains, casting a fiery glow across the sky, Marianne approached me. We're holding a memorial for those we've lost, she said softly. I understand you've lost companions too. I nodded, the memories of those who had fallen flickering through my mind like shadows at dusk. Yes, too many to count. The community gathered and names were spoken aloud, each one a solemn note in the symphony of remembrance. When it was my turn, I stepped forward, the words heavy on my tongue. Samuel, Jeremiah, and all the souls who stood by us, I said, my voice steady, but imbued with the gravity of what we had endured. After the memorial, I found myself wandering to the edge of the community, to a plot of land that had been turned over but never used. It was here that I had planned to lay Zoe to rest, had the worst come to pass. But the grave remained empty, a demonstration to the tenacity of life and the unbreakable bond between a cowgirl and her horse. As the days turned to weeks, I found a semblance of peace in the routines of this new life. The community, our sanctuary, became a place of healing, a place to rebuild. But it was more than that. It was a demonstration to what humanity could achieve when we banded together, a radar of excellence in a world darkened by the fog of ancient plagues. One morning, as I watched the sunrise paint the sky in hues of hope, I felt the stirrings of a new purpose. We had reached the end of our harrowing journey, but it was not the end of our story. It was instead the beginning of something greater, a chance to rise from the ashes of the world that was and forge something enduring in the world that would be. Dawn of the Desert Rose, I murmured to myself, a fitting name for this chapter of our lives. For like the unbreakable flower that blooms after the rain, we too had found a way to thrive amidst the desolation. And as long as the sun rose, as long as we drew breath, we would continue to strive, to innovate, to excel. For in the end, it was not just about surviving, it was about living. The curtain falls on our current tale. Gratitude for being part of the fog of ancient plagues with us. Trust in StoryWave AI to transform your creative prompts into compelling stories. Show your support by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Daily stories await to whisk you away. March 2024. Goodbye for now.